from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. 18 months ago, the Cube Research asserted that we are on the brink of a transformative shift toward intelligent data applications that are set to revolutionize business operations. At the time, we introduced the concept of Uber for all as a metaphor predicting that today's linear value chains would evolve into dynamic digital representations of a business, i.e. digital twins, where intelligent data applications empower firms to orchestrate entire ecosystems in real time. This week, these research insights were highlighted on the cover of The Economist in an article co-authored by George Gilbert of The Cube Research with the senior editor of AI Initiatives. The piece examines how digital twins are reshaping traditional business models. Our premise is that for the last 25 years, platform technology in business has been limited to consumer online services that match people to content or other people and functions that reserve resources like Uber or Airbnb. However, the emergence of digital twins allows businesses to orchestrate complex operations in mainstream businesses from end to end. This innovation facilitates a dynamic assembly of resources and expertise across entire ecosystems to uniquely serve each customer request, similar to how Uber connects riders with drivers. The impact on mainstream business operations is significant, heralding a transformation in business models. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I share our latest insights on the future of intelligent data platforms, and more specifically, we will dig into how we envision the transition from Web 2.0 applications to a new dynamic era supported by digital twins. We also share some spending data over the past 10 years that will serve as a representation for how we see the market unfolding over the next decade. First off, George, congratulations on getting the first of your articles published in The Economist. Your fantastic work in this regard has helped our community and the Cube research and vision the future. And it's really awesome to see such a rep respected publication, such as The Economist, picking up on the trends, the ideas that you've put forth and that we've socialized. George co-authored the article, which hit the cover of TheEconomist.com, along with Lud Ludwig Siegel, who shared on LinkedIn as well. George, great job. Congratulations. Thanks, Dave. Okay, by way of review, as you may recall, around 18 months ago, we started working on this idea of today's data and application platforms uh, evolving to become more Uber-like. We called it Uber for all, where the people, places, and things in a business would be orchestrated by a system that, like Uber, could integrate data across what used to be a linear value chain, and then harmonize those, dis those disparate data elements in near real time. And we used Uber as the metaphor where drivers, riders, ETAs, prices, destinations, and the like were assembled together on demand to satisfy a customer's needs and deliver a monetizable set of actions, all orchestrated by a single platform. And George, this is the vision for the future of intelligent data apps that we've been putting forth and that you put forth in the Economist art article. So we made Uber the organizing metaphor for the article, and, and we believe it will be seen as a lighthouse example by business historians in the future, really. Uh, the key to the metaphor and, and why we opened the article with this is that Uber can use its end-to-end -end orchestration to dynamically assemble the operational workflow to serve each customer. That's the key. Um, in this case, it's the optimal path to match a, a rider with a driver and then continually optimize the fastest or cheapest path to the destination. And this is the heart of the metaphor for mainstream business operations because orchestrating a digital twin means dynamically assembling an operational workflow to assemble and match each customer with the expertise and resources to fulfill their request. In the past, we could only do simple matching functions like consumer online services. We couldn't do sophisticated operational workflows. To get there, traditional business, however, needs to change, not just the technology, 
but the people and processes. Okay, so let's set the stage. Um, it, it, it's worth reviewing today's business platforms, which we show here, which largely organize what we're calling linear value chains. They organize them digitally. So here we're showing the journey from Web 2.0 to Enterprise Digital Twins. You see that linear value chain leading from you know the beginning all the way out to, to profit margin. This is kind of what we're calling the old way. George, walk us through this linear value chain model, and then we'll get into how it will evolve into so-called platforms. So to provide historical context, business management was designed to be a machine, really. It was modeled on the Prussian military. It was designed in the age of mass production 100 years ago to manage large fixed assets like assembly lines, re refineries, railroads. Um, and the people, processes, and technology of traditional business organizations were organized around these linear value chains, source, make, deliver. Um, this was popularized really uh, by Michael Porter's seminal research on strategy that's been orthodoxy for 40 plus years. And in this model, business owned and employed the people and resources that were in this value chain. Now, one of the core management functions was, the, was planning and control that converted these inputs, the people and resources, into products and services. But the core limitation was that it was organized for efficiency, not agility. And the uh, scope of control and the span of control was limited largely by what this machine could employ, what it could own, and what it could control internally. Great. Thank you for that, George. All right. As we've reported in previous breaking analysis episodes, the holy grail of seamless integration has been quite elusive. Rather, today's application estates, they're essentially islands of automation. And data, as we've said before, is generally locked inside the system. And as we've, we've often discussed in the past, the knowledge graph is this emerging linchpin of the transition to our Uber-like era. This today is missing really important pieces. And again, we've reported on this a lot, but one of them is the data harmonization layer, what people sometimes call the semantic layer. Uh, it, it, but it goes beyond today's metrics layer that you, you see being you know, promulgated by the likes of DBT and AtScale and others. But the knowledge graph leverages data from all applications with a common definition across the ecosystem's application portfolio. So George, this is the vision of true silo busting that we've talked about. Explain the difference between today's Web 2.0 world and the future of platforms as you see it. It's, it's really um, Web 2.0, which built on Enterprise 2.0, where we've been, we've been talking about integrating apps for decades, but we've only built these islands of automation and then with microservices, which was the Web 2.0 um, technical underpinning, um, we we really built these um, essentially droplets of functionality, but they each spoke their own um, uh, language. And, and that technology, the combination of these islands of automation and then these um, microservices that were only really integrated later in data lakes and the modern data stack, that is the technology that limited management's span of control to these hardwired connections between departmental or functional apps. And the first revolution, as you mentioned, that's coming along, that's going to change this is the technology to harmonize the data and application estates. We've been calling them digital twins. The technical implementation is knowledge graphs, and they convert that Tower of Babel shown in the lower right of the slide into an abstraction layer that harmonize it at all. Um, and that's what will enable analytics, specifically AI, to orchestrate the people, places, and things in a much greater span of control in real time. Great, thank you for that. Okay, let's dig deeper into how we see the orchestration of an ecosystem across an organization, its customers and suppliers using, again, Uber as the orchestrating metaphor, as George said, for this new era enabled by digital twins. So in this graphic, we show a digital representation of all the elements involved, or at least most of them in an Uber transaction. A rider initiates a request, people. The app knows where that rider is, i.e. places, and where cars, i.e. things, are proximate. The system offers the consumer a number of op options, varying in, in value, like big car, small car, black car, 
uh, uh, shared ride, et cetera. And then machine intelligence is put to use to figure out how long it's going to take to pick up the rider, the price based on the destination and overall demand and, and the, the distance of the drive, and ETA based on traffic and so forth. And, 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 and it brings together all these elements. So George, what would you add to this description and, and why is this relevant? I, I think you described it really well. The only thing I would add is that the architecture of today's systems is what's limiting us from, from implementing this sort of business model, which is if you have to extract in a batch mode all the data from all these different operational apps, centralize it in the um, data lake or the, the, the modern data stack, perform your analytics, and then reverse ETL it back, there's so much that gets lost. There's time, the data um, comes from applications that speak different languages. You need a real-time abstraction that allows a higher intelligence, which we'll get to as the next uh, breakthrough, um, to see what's going on across all these systems. And as you described, to match the rider to the driver, to find the route, to continually update the route, that can't happen as long as you're extracting data in batch mode, mixing it up, um, doing analysis, and then in some clues, sending it by reverse ETL back to the original applications. That cannot work. You need this new layer. And that brings us to the second um, uh, revolution where if you want to do this at scale with millions of riders and drivers every day, you can't do it with a hierarchical management system and you can't do it with traditional data architecture. And it's really important to point out here, we use Uber as the, the, the metaphor and the example, but uh, folks who follow this program, may you remember we had Uday Kiran Midasetti on, led the application team at Uber, and we dug into how they actually did it. It took many, many thousands of engineering hours and, highly, and to build a highly complex system uh, that is applicable really only to Uber. So what we're envisioning is a horizontal platform that can that can be Uber for all, meaning any business can take advantage of this uh, platform off the shelf. So let's now take a look at applying this metaphor to a business. This chart here shows dynamically assembling the workflows for each customer on demand. We've written about this a lot, uh, bringing in some of the work that we've done on Agentic, but let's focus here on how we... <clears throat> show an intelligent data app, which might dynamically assemble a workflow for each customer in real time. And so the fundamental assumption that we're using is that applications are integrated and the data supporting these apps is harmonized, that missing link that George just described. And the example we show here personalizes offerings for the customer based on the availability of products, for example, or time to deliver, various product attributes, et cetera and then is able to dynamically price the offering based on all these supply and, and demand and value dimensions. So the, George, the point of this diagram that you developed is that this is a highly automated system where virtually all aspects of the workflow are digitized. So walk us through how you see this playing out, please. So what you highlighted that the harmonization layer provides the, um, the enabling layer um, for the second revolution, which is agents. Agents are large language models that know how to plan, take action, invoke rules. They become, invoke tools, I should say, they become large action models. But for them to work really well, they need a common language that they're navigating and traversing. And they provide the productivity to orchestrate processes. So human managers can supervise these millions of rider and driver matches and routes. Now, this is the key. So the, the digital twin provides the world model by which agents can navigate, and then agents can be the essentially the machine tools that make the humans far more productive supervisors. Now, just by anecdote, it's worth reminding folks that 100 years ago, AT&T thought it would eventually need to employ all working age women, and yes, it was women at the time, in the country to be switchboard operators but technology ultimately made it possible for the consumers to be their own operators by dialing their own calls. And what we're talking about here with this digital platform with the digital twins and the agents is a similar revolution, but 
not in labor productivity like mass production or uh, consumer technology like the telephone. This is a, a revolution in management um, management technology. And it's not about agents that you hear solving mass Olympiads. That's nice and impressive. We're talking about essentially microservices that can be given a goal and that can invoke some set of workflows and tools and call on other agents to accomplish that goal. And the combination of humans supervising these armies of agents will remake how we organize work, turning traditional companies into platforms with previously unimaginable scope and control. And, and as we talked about last week on breaking analysis, that that the, the difference between th this and, and microservices, microservices are largely hard coded, uh, and, and as such, uh, they they are limited. So we're talking about uh, things that can't necessarily be be hard coded, where agents, intelligent a agents, really have a deeper understanding of the business. You know, by through through learning, there, I guess, autodidactic would be sort of a description as to to how they operate and they. Uh, work with other agents in concert uh, to develop this uh, th this vision or to to realize this vision that we're putting forth. So let's now bring in some ETR data to show some of the players uh, in this new era, and and we're going to comment on how the market has evolved. And this chart shows a 10-year history from ETR's data set. And the lines represent net score uh, on the vertical axis, which is a measure of spending velocity on a platform, and the horizontal access is time going back to January 2014. And you see that red dotted line at 40%, that represents a highly elevated spending level or spending momentum, uh, not not level, but spending momentum. So there's no indication of dollars spent, it's just percent of customers spending more when you net out those spending less. And the N in the latest July survey was over 1,700. And even when you go back 10 years ago, the Ns were well over 1,000, oftentimes north of 1,800. Now, we chose SAP and Oracle Fusion here as two examples of legacy systems that contain critical information that is necessary to tap for the vision that we've laid out. Now, as well, Salesforce is in that mix, and we've, we've added Databricks and Snowflake as representatives, representative firms that could, stress could, vie for the future of intelligent data apps if they can fill some of those missing pieces. And so... We've also superimposed the logos of Salonis, Enterprise Web, Relational AI, and Palantir as companies that are working on, at least we believe they are, and have seen some evidence of this, or they've even delivered on early versions of the harmonization layer that we so often talk about and have earlier in this episode. And you can see here that over the past decade, the representative systems, those legacy systems of SAP and Oracle, while they're very large, we know this, they've seen more maturity. And you can see that by the lines sort of decelerating. So less spending momentum, more customers just kind of keeping spending flat. Salesforce, as a customer management system, customer sort of focus system, has seen pretty steady momentum, although you can see it, it maturing and dipping below that red dotted line toward the out years. And then meanwhile, you got Databricks and Snowflake. They remain above that line, that 40% magic line, with the former crossing over when the market shifted to having much more of a focus on cost. We've talked about this, a lot of the data engineering and the hardcore data pipelining work coming out of Snowflake, going into alternatives like Databricks. And George, the names we show at the top of the chart in logo form are at least part of the missing link. As we discussed last week, there are connections to the back end, you know, to those legacy systems, more than just those two that we've cited, but those two are representative. And then you've got that harmonization layer. There's the governance that we've written about and talked about extensively and an orchestration an orchestration layer uh, or, or capability for agents, which is a, an emerging and highly valuable piece of the puzzle that can interpret and manage um, the, t the, the top, manage to the top-down metrics uh, of the business and then orchestrate bottoms-up outcomes. George, your thoughts, what would you add to this? Um, I think you laid it out really well, which is, we're seeing a shift away from the silos um, toward where people putting more and more effort towards platforms that try and integrate and harmonize. We don't have all the harmonization technology as you laid out. Those are the four candidates right now we think are best positioned. And then the agent layer comes next. And as we talked about last week, we think we'll hear that from Salesforce next month 
and from Microsoft um, two months after that. Okay, let's let's end this episode by summarizing the implications to the business. George, you, you developed a, a, this graphic here, which implies that there's a, going to be an evolution that will affect the application programming model, the admin model, the business model, and, and the overall industry structure. Can you elaborate and, and take us through this concept? It's just we're going through a profound transition. The Web 2.0 um, was w emerged 20 plus years ago, and that was centered around these the application programming model, the admin model, the business model, the industry structure we've been living with for, for a couple decades. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple things that um, in, in this era of the enterprise digital twin, businesses become platforms and they essentially become ecosystems of digital twins. Um, and that's, it's an interlocking collection of platforms the platforms, the digital twins you control, and then those of your partners, suppliers, potentially customers. Um, the admin model has been, you build it, you run it. That's Werner Vogel's famous um, sort of dictum from some years back. It That's not going to work in the world we're moving to. It's got to be, it runs itself. Um, the business model itself, it's platforms over applications, um, you program it with data or customize it with data. And the pricing model is not utility-based so much as much closer to the customer outcomes. That's where the real upside is. And the last point to make is industry structure for platforms has always been winner take most. And so I think we're going to see a very, very different world. The world that people talk about with consumer online services and big tech we may see that coming to the rest of um, the rest of the economy. And I think it's also important to say that this is not, not just about platforms that are developed by technology companies. This is industry or uh, companies, leaders within industry, within manufacturing, with auto, within automobiles, within energy, uh, et cetera, building out uh, this capability for their ecosystem. Sure, they're going to be relying on the technologies that we know and love and talk about all the time the data platforms, those legacy applications, the connectors in between, the emerging capabilities, the AI uh, uh, capabilities, the LLMs and the, S the small language models and the action models and all the surrounding tooling, et cetera. But those will be applied to dramatically transform industries and the structure of those industries. George, as always, great work. Thanks so much for your contributions to, to Breaking Analysis. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production, and they also handle our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hope is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Thank you all for your great work. We really appreciate it. And remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you can do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. If you want to get in touch, email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Or please let us know what you think. Comment on the LinkedIn posts that we put out there. And please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert and the Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.